rejected Alabama's latest congressional map today, ruling that a new map needed to be drawn because Republican lawmakers had failed to comply with orders to create a second majority black district or something close to it. In a sharp rebuke, the judges ordered that the new map be independently drawn, taking the responsibility away from the Republican-controlled legislature while chastising state officials who ultimately did not even nurture the ambition to provide the required remedy. Those are words from the court today. Americans' feelings about higher education have turned sharply negative. The percentage of young adults who said that a college degree is very important fell to 41% from 74%. Only about a third of Americans now say they have a lot of confidence in higher education. Among young Americans in Generation Z, 45% say they have a high school diploma, uh, say that a high school diploma is all you need today to ensure financial security. And in contrast to the college-focused parents of a decade ago, now almost half of American parents say they would prefer that their children not enroll in a four-year college. The impeachment trial of Ken Paxton, the Republican Attorney General of Texas, began this morning on the floor of the state Senate, where its 31 members are gathering to weigh allegations of corruption and abuse of office and decide on Mr. Paxton's fate. Paxton is facing 20 articles of impeachment and allegations focused on his use of his office to benefit an Austin real estate figure. Former Proud Boys leader Henry Enrique Tario was sentenced today to 22 years in prison for disrupting the peaceful transfer of presidential power in the January 6, 2021 Capitol riot. Tario was convicted of seditious conspiracy and obstructing the congressional proceeding meant to confirm the 2020 presidential election as part of a riot that U.S. District Judge Timothy Kelly said last week broke America's long democratic tradition of peaceful transfers of power. The prison term for Tario was the most severe penalty handed down so far to any of the more than 1,100 people charged in connection with the Capitol attack. Tennessee State Representative Gloria Johnson, one of the three Democrats reprimanded this year for lending a protest, for leading a protest, I should say, against gun violence on the state house floor, has launched a bid for the U.S. Senate in her deep red home state of Tennessee. The saga raised Johnson's profile among Democrats across the country, and it gives her a jolt of momentum as she embarks on a difficult task dethroning GOP Senator Marsha Blackburn in a state that hasn't elected a Democratic senator in more than three decades. And a state judge ruled on Saturday that a Florida redistricting plan pushed by Republican Governor Ron DeSantis violates the state constitution and is prohibited from being used for any future U.S. congressional elections since it diminishes the ability of black voters in North Florida to pick a representative of their choice. The judge sent the plan back to the Florida legislature with instructions that lawmakers should draw a new congressional map that complies with the Florida Constitution. The decision was the latest to strike down new congressional maps in Southern states over concerns that they dilute black voting power. Well, Trump's co-defendants are already starting to turn against him. In court documents and hearings, lawyers for people in Trump's orbit, both high-level advisors and lesser-known associates, are starting to reveal glimmers of a tried-and-true strategy in cases with many defendants. And that strategy is portray yourself as a hapless pawn while piling blame on the apparent kingpin. For example, Trump's former personal lawyer, Jenna Ellis, has started to turn on Trump as uh, he is not paying her legal fees in the Georgia election case. The lawyer, that is Jenna Ellis, has also become a more vocal supporter of Trump's main rival in the GOP 2024 presidential primary, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. 
This is Ariva Martin in real time, and I'm your host, Ariva Martin. This is your one-stop destination for today's trending news, expert analysis, and my unfiltered opinions. This is hour two of Ariva Martin in real time, and this is the hour where we go deep. We dig behind the headlines on some of the biggest stories of the day. Now, some of these stories make huge headlines, and others have a ginormous impact. Today, we're talking about a story that I think does both, big headlines and huge impact. We are talking about the Supreme Court and how far can its justices go in avoiding any kind of accountability with respect to their conduct outside the court, especially conduct that reeks of ethics violations and reeks of perhaps playing favorites with wealthy, and in this case, wealthy GOP donors. Uh, we had a glimpse at the financial reports of Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito last week, reports that were filed after both justices asked for an extension of time to do so. And in those reports, we saw evidence of private jet trips that Clarence Thomas took on a jet owned by a GOP a billionaire donor who has cases before the Supreme Court uh, where this donor has an interest. Uh, we've also seen in Alito's uh, financial filings, again, uh, stays at expensive resorts and other kinds of gifts that you would not expect to see judges, particularly judges on the highest court of the land, taking from individuals that do business before the court. Uh, but that's what apparently is happening. And you uh, see the Democrats in the U.S. Senate in particular, uh, led by Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, trying to reel in this conduct of these justices. And in fact, uh, Senator Sheldon filed an ethics complaint today with Chief Justice John Roberts, and this is over an interview that Samuel Alito gave uh, at the end of July, where he was questioned about Congress's power to impose ethics on the Supreme Court. And Alito opines about their ability, there being the Congress's ability to impose any kind of ethics on the court, and Senator Whitehouse says, wait a minute, this in and of itself, this interview is a violation because these justices should not be giving interviews to the media, to this uh, conservative lawyer who was doing the interviewing about cases that can end up before the Supreme Court. And Democratic Senator Whitehouse believes the issue of who has control over the Supreme Court and can ethics rules be imposed on them is, in fact, a case that could end up before the very court. Uh, if it sounds confusing, it's not. It's really just this simple. The folks sitting on the Supreme Court get appointed, uh, get confirmed by the Senate, lifetime tenure jobs very little, if any, oversight by the two other branches of government. Uh, Democrats in the U.S. Senate trying to change that, and the nine justices, particularly Alito and Clarence Thomas, seem to be resisting any and all efforts by the Senate to impose any ethics rules on them. And so we get Supreme Court justices taking private jets uh, donors buying homes for their mother in the case of Clarence Thomas and paying the tuition of their surrogate son in the case of Clarence Thomas. And yet somehow they are trying to convince the American people that they are not biased uh, in their decision making. Well, the reality is the American people, we're not buying it. There is an all time low confidence level by the American people in the Supreme Court and the arrogance of justices like Alito only adds to this level of distrust. I have two Supreme Court experts uh, with me when we come forward. I'm going to talk about what can be done to regulate the conduct of these justices. And is it time to completely overhaul our Supreme Court as we know it 
particularly given the attitude and comments of a Justice Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito. Stay with us right here on KBLA Talk 1580. Be sure to check out our KBLA team favorites at kbla.store today. That's kbla.store for all the official merch on your favorite. I'm back, and this is Ariva Martin in real time, and I'm your host, Ariva Martin, and this is Hour 2, and we are talking about the need for some kind of pretty radical reform of the U.S. Supreme Court in light of some of the conduct we've seen by justices, particularly Justice Roberts and Justice Alito, and a ethics complaint filed by U.S. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse today to Chief Justice Roberts regarding an interview given by Samuel Alito to a conservative lawyer at the end of July. And in this hour, I'm joined by Gabe Roth. He's the executive director of an organization called Fix the Court. And Philip Blumo is joining us on the line. He is president, U.S. Term Limits Organization. Thanks to both of you for joining me. Let's start with you, Gabe. Uh, give us uh, the uh, kind of the lay of the land as it relates to this complaint that was filed today by uh, Sheldon Whitehouse. What is it about and why is it significant? Uh, it's significant for, for a lot of reasons. I mean, first of all, uh, let's start with the fact that this is not really a thing. Like, you can't really sort of, under federal law, under existing protocols, file a complaint against a Supreme Court justice. Now, if it was Judge Alito, one of the 2,500 lower court judges that gave the interview to the Wall Street Journal and was speaking with individuals that are later going to have business before the court in those pages, uh, you could file a complaint. Anyone in America can file a complaint against a lower federal court judge. But the Supreme Court is outside of those federal guidelines, and that needs to change. That's the point that Senator Whitehouse is making by filing this complaint. He's saying, look, if we had proper ethical protocols in place, this is how an ethics complaint, an ethics complaint process would proceed. There would be a complaint issued, which is what White House did today. And then there would be fact finding by the person in charge of the ethics committee. Of course, there is no ethics committee at the Supreme Court. Again, that is what Sheldon Whitehouse is trying to do by filing this complaint to point out that there is no, not only is there no process, there's not even an inbox in which to file the complaint. And this is, again, is completely apart and different than every other level of the judiciary and every other branch of government. There's a Senate Ethics Committee, a House Ethics Committee, an Office of Government Ethics in the Executive Branch. That does not exist at the Supreme Court. So today's complaint is really sort of putting out a, a blueprint as to what should happen if we had a court with accountability. And it's really throwing down the gauntlet to Chief Justice Roberts and saying, look, these protocols are not in place. You need to create an ethics committee. You need to create an ethics office and an ethics code and an inbox for complaints. And I think that by filing this complaint, uh, Senator Whitehouse is raising these issues in front of not only the justices, but also the American people. So, Philip, how did we get here mm -hmm. where we have this <laughs> one branch of government, as Gabe just said, that has no oversight? no ethics right. uh, committee, no process in place. And that's different from lower court judges, is different uh, for Congress people and senators and even the president of the United States. How did we carve out this untouchable space for our Supreme Court justices? Well, you know, the founders of this country uh, were trying to strike a balance and they recognized that, that uh, Members of the Supreme Court need to be somewhat detached and not connected to current politics not con uh, and are not really there to represent people like, say, representatives in Congress are. And so they really created a, a, a lifetime term where they'd be free to basically uh, act out their conscience. The problem is, is that we've had unbalanced courts. Uh, we've had particular individuals that are now in there for life. And so what our organization argues, much like we do for the Congress, um, that there should be rotation in office in the Supreme Court to create a more balanced court where each president will have the opportunity theoretically to um, to, to nominate the same amount of of uh, justices going forward and that they would not be there forever. So, Gabe, uh, Phillips said the founding fathers wanted the judiciary as it relates to the Supreme Court, not the entire judiciary, but the Supreme Court to be free from politics, to not have to uh, answer in a way that, answer to constituents in a way that senators and 
uh, Congress people do. But do you think the uh, founders could anticipate a Supreme Court with a Clarence Thomas and a Samuel Alito and there are others, but let's talk about those because those are the ones who've been in the news lately that have these very messy intertwined uh, relationships with donors that are ideologues, donors that have staked out positions uh, on cases that are appearing on cases that make their way to the Supreme Court. So, so I think, man, that, that is, that's, a, that's a tough question because I think the founders in, I think, okay, maybe in like the 1780s and the 1790s when people were writing the constitution and were writing the, the Federalist Papers, they were trying to establish this independence as a reaction to King George III firing colonial judges, right? So King George III oversaw Correct. judges in England and judges of the colonies. He was firing them willy-nilly. State constitutions, which predate the U.S. Constitution, gave judges life tenure, so that became part of the U.S. Constitution. But if you fast forward a couple of decades, um, the the in in the early 1800s, you had the 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 seminal case of the Supreme Court, Marbury versus Madison, where the Chief Justice of the United States had a conflict in the case and still participated in the case because he had a specific view in the case and no one could really stop him. Uh, that was in 1803. I think in 1804. Congress made it so the Supreme Court didn't even sit that year. They just skipped a term. Uh, and also that year, they reduced the number of justices from 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 uh, six to five. So President, I think, Jefferson didn't get a, a pick. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the thing is, is that all of these, you know, the, maybe the, the the initial founding generation of us, you know, but like maybe maybe when the founders were in their 40s, they saw thought something. But by the time they got around to their 50s and 60s, they were playing politics with the court is sort of the point that I'm getting to. Politics has always That's been right. a part of the court. I think we'd be naive to to, to not think about it. Uh, uh, you know, the um, during the during the Civil War. I mean, gosh, the you know Dred Scott led in in, in the large large you know in, in certain aspects to you can draw a direct line from that to the Civil War. You can draw a direct line to that to to some of the Confederate uh, justices. You know, not no longer thankfully being a part of the court, and then Lincoln getting more justices. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Roosevelt tried to to add justices to to change the uh, trajectory of the New Deal. Um, you know, the, the Eisenhower. I mean, I, I could go through every president in every era. The court has always been part of politics. The fact that people are denying it is just completely ahistorical. You know, as 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 Phil pointed out, like this, there was this ideal that the judges are going to be apart from politics and apart from influence. But if you look at American history, that hasn't panned out. And and really, it's this era where we're not doing anything in response to the ethics crisis of the court, that is the anomaly. When there was an ethics crisis in the court in the 60s and 70s with uh, Justice Abe Fortas, who had to resign because he was uh, taking money that he probably shouldn't have, there was a whole mm -hmm. ethics protocol that was established in, in the judiciary and a financial disclosure requirement. Um, who, who, stop right there for a second. Who established that protocol? Uh, Chief Justice uh, Warren Burger. Uh, so, so even Abe when Fortas, the court... Yeah. Okay, so the the court, there's some history you're saying, Gabe, of the court policing itself. Correct. I.e. the chief justice implementing some ethics rules and those rules mm -hmm. uh, having to be followed, obviously, by the, the court and causing Justice Fortas to mm -hmm. uh, be removed or to resign from the court. Yeah, Taft did it. And when he was chief justice 100 years mm -hmm. ago, Rehnquist did it when he was Justice thir chief justice 30 years ago. It's really been Chief Justice Roberts. And I don't know if it's because he can't get a consensus. He doesn't want to move on ethics until he has all nine of the uh, justices with him. But I think, you know, he, he's got to really assert some leadership here and say, look, enough is enough. The American people have lost confidence in the court, putting aside the, the, the opinions, which could be a whole other third hour of your show with some of the ridiculous opinions mm -hmm. that have come down. But just putting just looking at the institutional uh, integrity of the court, that is really being questioned by the American people like never before. So Chief Justice Roberts needs to show so show some leadership, needs to tell uh, Alito and Thomas to get off their addiction to private planes and really make the the court come into, uh, you know, kicking and screaming into 21st century best practices and ethical leadership. But Philip, what power does Roberts have to do this? Because Alito and Clarence Thomas seem like they are so, uh, you know, stuck in their notion that they are right. Alito's in particular, that they seem to have so much, you know, so much hubris and they've been so arrogant mm -hmm. about their conduct that, 
even if Roberts did have the courage to say something to them or to try to impose some rules on them, don't they have the right, right. to reject them? They do. They have, can. They could. They are. They are there for life, according to the U.S. Constitution. Now, I'd point out that Congress has a, a lot of power in this to be a check on the Supreme Court, in that the number of justices is not set in the U.S. Constitution, and so that is something that the Congress and administrations have messed with over the years, as Gabe mentioned. And I think that's a very important power. And again, I'd like to say that the uh, another thing that was not included originally, but can be done via via amendment and maybe through some other means that we can talk about that we can create a situation where the court turns over and that these people are not if a bad apple gets in there he's not in there forever mm -hmm. so you're, you're saying uh, eliminate this concept of lifetime tenure and create some yes, term lifetime limits tenure, correct now lifetime tenure used to be a lot shorter than it used to be because lifetimes were shorter right but the um and i think that's an out i think it's a very outdated notion that someone's going to stay there uh, for, you know, all that time. And it also creates a situation where where uh, this is gained, you know, the age of the justices we're choosing and things like that. And when they retire, it's all based on politics and gained and becomes very deeply political and very acrimonious. And I mm -hmm. think that if you had an 18-year term limit in which that you can expect to be in there only for a certain amount of time, an 18-year 18, 18 staggered term limit means that each president normally would be able to make two uh, additions to the court or two nominations to the court under normal circumstances. And I think that would go a long way to creating balance in the court, or at least the balance that voters are looking for, not just bad luck. And then, um, and also to ensure that bad apples and also in the age of Feinstein and Mitch McConnell to be mentioned that, you know, when people get much older, they may not be quite as functional as they were when they first started out in the office. And I think that's another, another uh, issue that uh, term limits help address. Yeah. So I, I want to stay for a moment. Thanks for uh, enlightening us, Philip, on this issue of how your organization sees it and it's, it's with respect to term limits. But I, I'm really curious about yeah. Justice Roberts and this power mm -hmm. that any chief justice has to self-govern, to you know, implement some rules and what might cause him or her, in this case it's a him, to do so since, again, there's no obvious way to force him to do that, i.e. through any kind of uh, legislation coming out of Congress or Senate or any kind of executive action coming out of the executive branch. When we come forward, I want to talk about, you know, what pressure can we put on Justice Roberts? Is he likely to respond to it? And what will it take to change things like term limits and the number mm -hmm. of justices on the court? We're going to talk about all of that when we come forward on KBLA Talk 1580 of depth and detail be sure to tune in tab is smiling we, came we are back and this is our two of Ariva Martin in real time and in this hour we're talking about the need to reform our Supreme Court given the American uh, people's lack of trust in the institution and part of that is based not mm -hmm. only on some of the decisions that have been issued by the court on things such as abortion rights and gun control but also on some of the personal conduct of justices, particularly Justice Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito, Gabe Roth, the executive yeah. director of Fix the Court, and Philip Blumo, president, U.S. Term Limits Organization, is also, uh, both of them are joining me in this hour. So, Gabe, you talked about Justice Roberts needing to take some action, but since, again, there's no consequences if he fails to take action, there's not any uh, you know discipline that he can face from any other branch of government? What might cause him to uh, you know take action against his fellow justices? He seems to be either oblivious, tone deaf, or protecting Alito and Thomas. He sees these reports. He knows how bad it looks uh, for Clarence Thomas to say, "I needed to take a private jet because I was warned about the leakage of this uh, decision in Dobbs." If, if you were concerned, why not ask for some assistance from the federal government rather than going to your billionaire friend and getting on a private jet? I mean, that explanation made absolutely no sense, seemed like a form of gaslighting by the justice, uh, by Justice Thomas. Yeah, well, I mean, going back to, to Chief Justice Roberts, let me just 
mention a couple things that my organization, Fix the Court, has tried to do in, ter in, in terms of trying to uh, force his hand to do something on, on ethics. So the first thing we did is we worked with uh, Democrats in the Senate on a uh, amendment to the, to the Supreme Court's budget. So the Supreme Court would every year gets about $150 million from the taxpayers. And in the amendment that we proposed that was introduced, but unfortunately we couldn't get, get it past the finish line, but it sent a message. It basically said that we, the Congress, are going to withhold $10 million of your non-security funding until you do something on ethics. Now, this is something that I, in my organization, have been wanting to do for years. But this is the first year that it actually was introduced in a committee, in legislative language. So $10 million of, of non-security funding that, that could go towards, you know, that would $10 million would pay for all the justices' clerks. So instead of every justice having four clerks to help them write opinions. Well, sorry, you don't have ethics. Well, now you don't have clerks. So th that's sort of the theory is to get them to the table is to take away some of that discretionary taxpayer dollars. And I think that most Americans would be fine with, you know, having the Supreme Court only make 140 million instead of 150 million. The second thing we did was we worked uh, with bipartisan group of congressmen um, uh, and women. One, uh, uh, Lisa Murkowski from Alaska, a Republican, and Angus King, uh, who's an independent from Maine, but caucuses with the Democrats. So effectively bipartisan, one, one D and one R, uh, on a bill that would, that it, it's active right now, it's, it's being debated, that would create an ethics office in the Supreme Court. It would require the creation of an ethics office in the Supreme Court. So again, that's trying to force Chief Justice Roberts' hand, saying, okay, you don't want to do this on your own. Well, then here's money, here's language, here's a requirement that you have an ethics officer to which the American people can send complaints that will then be investigated uh, um, within the confines of the Supreme Court. So, so those are two things that that we're doing. I mean, th you know, there's no magic bullet, right? There's no magic wand. They're not all of a sudden going to become uh, ethical and accountable at the Supreme Court. But I think that finding creative tactics like those, and I, you know, there's no uh, uh, monopoly on good ideas. I'm more than welcome to, to hear others at info at fixthecourt.com. Yeah. But I think those sort of creative ways um, is, is how we're going to move the ball down the field. So I, I know I'd like to make a point. Go oh, ahead, Phil. No, go ahead. Oh, I wanted to make a point. Um, another uh, lever that the, the the rest of the government in our system of checks and balances has um, is, let me back up and, and point out that the, the lifetime um, career tenure of a Supreme Court justice is, quote, during good behavior. And, the, and that does leave something that, that, according to the Constitution, and that definitely leaves a window open. For instance, a Supreme Court justice can be impeached if his infractions um, reach that level, um, just like a president can. And, and who, who can, can initiate impeachment efforts against a Supreme Court justice and who has the final vote on that impeachment? The, 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 the U.S. House, the, just like the president, the U.S. House has the power to, uh, uh, to impeach and the Senate to convict. This has only happened once in U.S. history back in 1805. Um, and I even forget why he was impeached, but it's probably, you know, a corruption, uh, probably a corruption incident or something. Actually, I actually don't recall. I apologize. But that, that can be done. And that's one, that's a sledgehammer type of leverage that you have if you think that the, that the um, bad actions are raised, to that, are, are raised to that level. But we know impeachment is also very political. And there's no way oh, yeah. a Republican Congress is going to impeach a conservative judge, no matter how egregious, right. at least in this climate, and is is not likely to happen. Right. Uh, so you would need right. the both houses of both the House and the Senate to be in agreement or else we end up like with Donald Trump, two impeachments in the house and no removal or no conviction right. in the Senate. So uh, let's talk about other ways to reform the court. Uh, Gabe, lots of pressure on Democrats when this com this topic comes up for the Democrats to make as a part of their platform. Uh, if they have all three branches of government, the house, or they have the House, the Senate, and the White House, 
that they would move to implement changes on the court, either term limits or expanding the court. We hear a lot about that. It doesn't have to be nine members uh, per the Constitution. Uh, expanding it to 15 to address these two stolen seats by Republicans. Uh, tell us how that would work, assuming you had a Democratic Congress and Senate and White House willing to sign such a bill. Yeah, I mean, it, the... Adding justices to the court could be done by simple legislation. It, it's a 20-word bill, and it's been introduced in, in the House and the Senate by a handful of Democrats. That didn't, you know, there's never been a vote on it in either House of, of Congress, but it's been introduced in the last two Congresses. Um, and I think the numbers that they're going with is, is adding four justices to go from nine to 13. Um, you know, it's, it's an interesting idea that the, the number of justices has changed over half a dozen times in the history of the United States. Um, you know, personally, it's not a proposal that I, or my organization supports. I think it's just would be relying too much on this juristocracy and this idea that, you know, the Supreme court is going to be the final arbiter on everything we do with, as opposed to having a constitutional conversation where, you know, Congress passes some laws, maybe the Supreme Court says it's but, unconstitutional. But Gabe, or maybe, Gabe, Gabe yes. what you're saying doesn't work in this highly partisan world we live in. We can't have conversations about the Constitution. Republicans in the House right now want to have conversations about impeaching Joe Biden for some corruption that they've not produced one evidence of corruption. So how do we get to a more substantive conversation with people who are dead set on uh, not governing and not engaging in these kind of serious conversations, but enacting revenge on the White House because of their, their made up uh, theory that the White House is somehow responsible for the indictments of Donald Trump and, and other reasons not related to, you know, reality. Yeah, I mean, you're right. There are there are a lot of you know norm breaking that is sort of makes it difficult to to imagine some sort of some sort of action. Uh, uh, what, whatever your favorite action is, I mean, I like the 18 year term limits. I fix the court worked with uh, members of Congress to introduce a, a bill on on that um, because I don't think it would require a constitutional amendment. But yes, there are certain norms that would have yeah. to exist. I think. Look, you know. To me, the 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 issue is the amount of power that the Supreme Court has, and whatever can be done to reduce that power, I think, is a positive step. I mean, I think the idea that, um, you know, and what I was gonna, <laughs> what I was getting to is is jurisdiction stripping. Like, there is no reason that the, that the Supreme Court needs to decide every single uh, policy disagreement that we have. Why is the Supreme Court? Uh, uh, putting out a ruling on the Obama clean power plan during the Biden administration. You know, why, why is the Supreme court telling universities who they can and can't accept? There are certain things that are just sort of outside the realm of what, like 20 years ago, any one of us would have thought, Oh yeah, the Supreme court, can Supreme court can't decide a presidential election. The Supreme court can't tell us who can vote or to uh, make decisions of life or death or to say who gets healthcare, uh, how women control their bodies, but they're making those decisions. And I think that honestly, you know, because I don't love a uh, uh, juristocracy to me, I think jurisdiction stripping is a better answer than court expansion. But I think all of these things should be part of the conversation because the end goal should be something where the people themselves are deciding how policy works in the United States and not nine unelected people in robes in Washington. Right. But we can't even get to the conversation about jurisdiction stripping uh, in our system of government right now that is broken on so many levels. Uh, when we come forward, we're going to talk about yeah what a constitutional amendment would look like if we wanted to have a major overhaul of the court, which would include some oversight by some other branch of government. What would that take? And would that be you know, favorable or would that just create more chaos at the court level? Uh, stay with us, KBLA Talk 1580. I'm so thrilled to have this. Okay, Gabe and Philip, let's talk about okay. those things that can be done at the legislative level through a majority vote versus things related to overhauling the Supreme Court that would have to uh, be done through some kind of amendment to our Constitution. So, Philip, if we mm -hmm. wanted to 
give some branch of government, be it the, the Congress or Senate, mm-hmm. you know, power over the Supreme Court. Could that be done through just a simple majority vote? Possibly, yes. There's been um, a lot of work done on this, and I think it's pretty much consensus. Well, I don't know. I wouldn't go that far. But it's um, it's likely that could be done. And the reason why is although Supreme Court justices should be allowed to serve uh, for basically life as long under good behavior, according to the Constitution, um, it doesn't mention what kind of service they would be performing. A lot of federal judges, or I'm sorry, federal judges can move up to a senior status um, where they're not doing, uh, where they don't, don't have the same duties they had before, and yet they remain a federal judge. And so I think there's a lot of a move towards redefining the role of service of a, uh, a Supreme Court justice after they move beyond, say, the 18-year term limit, where they don't lose the job, and therefore the Constitution is obeyed, but their uh, kind of service changes. And I point out something about polarization that you mentioned, um, that Term limits is something that two thirds of Americans support. Term limits on, on the Supreme Court, you know, even a higher percentage believe in it for the Congress, but two thirds believe in it for Supreme Court, and that includes majorities of Democrats and Republicans. So there so is. So if there's possi- consensus there is a about it, here. well, if if there is that consensus, is it the case where the lawmakers? are out of step with mm-hmm. the American people, which we know they often are on issues of abortion. That's one example. So it doesn't, I mean, it's great Absolutely. that two thirds of us think that, but the folks that sure. have the power often are not voting in a way that's consistent with the way the American people are thinking. So Gabe, Correct. what we can't, again, I'm just trying to narrow down what changes would require, what changes to the court would require some kind of amendment to the Constitution? Because we know a constitutional amendment is far more difficult to achieve than a vote where you need the simple majority in the House or the Senate. Well, I think that, you know, if I were to start over and, in other words, have the power to pass a constitutional amendment, what I would do is make it so you have a Supreme Court of, instead of maybe nine justices, something like 109 justices. Maybe all of the current federal appeals courts would be on the Supreme Court. And then every two weeks, because justices sit in two-week sessions, you would have nine out of those 109 judges hearing the cases that come to the court. The problem that we have now is that the justices have discretion over the cases that they hear and only four justices are needed to decide to hear a case. So if you have maybe four justices out of the nine deciding to hear a case and they're all liberal, and then two weeks passes, and then it ends up being a conservative panel that hears the case, then you're gonna, there are different sort of gamesmanship that you're gonna have that you're gonna want to regress towards the mean and not have all these sort of ultra, uh, super liberal, super conservative cases before the court, because you don't know which panel and which judges are going to hear the, the cases. So if I were starting over, I would say a giant Supreme Court from which we would pick nine men and women every couple of weeks that could rotate in and out. And so therefore, I think their decisions would hew more closely to the 50 yard line and we wouldn't have um, you know, such uh, polarization and politicization like we currently do. But we don't have that now. Sounds like a great idea in theory, but I I guess folks want to know right now, what can we do? We can pressure Roberts, who can thumb his nose at us, which apparently that's what he's been doing. He doesn't want to do anything, obviously, that uh, I guess offends, you know, his fellow justices on the court. Uh, We can have organizations like yours that continue to put pressure. But is there anything else more concrete? Because it feels like to me, without any oversight, what prevents Clarence Thomas from taking more gifts, more trips with, you know, Harlan Crow? I think I think that's gonna that's gonna continue. I'm I'm almost you know uh, more worried about the next generation of justices that you know whenever the next Republican president becomes president, he or she is going to to pit a couple of former Justice Thomas clerks to be the next set of justices. And I'm worried about their ethics. So I'm already working towards that and trying to rein in some of, some of, some of their bad behavior uh, on, on the baby justices, uh, if you will. So, you know, I, I think that, look, you know, this is a California-based show. 
Both of your senators are on the Senate Judiciary Committee. Both Senators Feinstein and Padilla care about this issue. The member, number of California members, and, and Adam Schiff is a local a member to y'all uh, who care about this issue and are on the Judiciary Committee. This needs to be a steady drumbeat. You know, eventually, I think the justices will feel shame and they will act on their own, number one. Number two, I think that there is going to be a political price to pay for people at the ballot box in 2024 that oppose the idea of Supreme Court ethics. Why would you oppose Supreme Court ethics? It is insane that the Republican Party, which five years ago passed a bill that included Supreme Court ethics. It was called the Judiciary Room Act. You can it was introduced by uh, Daryl Issa. You can look it up. Uh, they are now on totally the opposite end of this issue and totally on the wrong side of this issue. So I think there is going to be, and this is outside of my uh, 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 Aegis as head of Fix the Court because we're a 501c3. But on an electoral perspective, I do believe that there will be a price to pay for opposing basic ethics requirements at the Supreme Court, just like there is a political price to pay for having, you know, being against uh, 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 the right to choose from, you know, wh whatever consent. I don't even know what the Republicans are saying now. I feel like it changes all the time. But I think there's going to be a political price to pay here, just like there was maybe not as big, obviously, as, as it would be for abortion. But but I think the time has come and and, and, and our elected officials are going to see that. And I think they're going to move that that way as we get closer to November 2024. No, great point. And we do know shame does work, may not change the behavior of that individual, but it can motivate voters uh, to get out and vote, as you said, for those elected officials who are opposing that this one body receive this kind of, you know, hands off treatment where every other individual in our government is subject to some oversight. Uh, Philip, give you the last word on yeah. this. What do you think it's going to take to reform this court? Well, as you know, because of my what, because of the stance I've taken about term limits, that's a key one and the main one for me. I wouldn't be dismissive of the of an amendment because we have passed a amendment to the Constitution establishing term limits before on the president in 1951. It can be done, and you also have an issue that's um, supported by 67 percent of voters and majorities of both parties. And I think there's a path to have that done even without a constitutional amendment by the Congress under the method that I suggested that. Um, proposals have been written by changing the type of service done by a Supreme Court justice after 18 years. So I think that um, the term limits is something I think is on the table and popular and can get around some of the polarization problems that we've seen. Do you see, Philip, uh, Democrats jumping on the term limits? Because I've seen Democrats waffle on Supreme Court reform uh, periods where mm -hmm. there's a lot of conversation about it and seem to be a gaining momentum. And then, uh, you know, Biden's kind of waffling on it and doesn't want to, quote unquote, politicize the court. So what are you seeing amongst elected officials on the Democratic side? Well, it's it's tough and I'm not in control of any politicians or their views or what they do. I just know that if we agitate as a people for it, when we have the majority, so it isn't like it isn't a um, uh, you know a cry in the wilderness. We're talking about the majority of people in this country, a big majority of people in this country that are pushing for this, and mm -hmm. so politicians will be rewarded who call for it. No. Good point. Uh, thanks to both of you. Really interesting topic. I, it's just so troubling for me as a lawyer uh, to see our Supreme Court have uh, you know undermined itself by the actions that these justices are taking taking and then by Chief Justice Roberts being recalcitrant and refusing to do anything about it. it it's very disappointing uh, to see the trust of the court be eroded in the way that it is. But, uh, you know, obviously, as both of you have said, it's up to us, the people, to demand the changes that we want to see. And we can do that as we're approaching this 2024 election. So everybody, make sure your elector, whoever you're voting for, is someone that is in favor of ensuring that the Supreme Court hew to the same ethics that all of us have to hew to in our respective jobs and positions. Again, thanks so much, Gabe and Phil, for joining me. The next voice that you hear will be Robin Ayers in the Raw Report right here on KBLA Talk 1580. Don't touch that dial. <laughs> Access granted.
in a survey conducted by the public opinion research firm Eviteris. KBLA Talk 1580 consistently emerged as the station of choice for black audiences in the Los Angeles media market and beyond. The survey also revealed that the vast majority of black audiences are concerned about the lack of black-owned media and are more likely to listen to talk radio that focuses on issues that impact the black community. 